Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Hannah Harris, and I'm the program coordinator with the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience. This is our second interview in a series uh, focused on food systems literacy and um, climate smart land management and also climate action in the Wood River Valley and beyond. Today, we have Oliver Mullen and Penelope Hunt with us from Wood River High School's Water Club, which is their environmental climate action organization. And so before we dive into questions more related to youth activism, could you both please tell us a little bit about yourselves and also how you became interested in climate activism work? Oliver, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> yeah, I can go first. Um, so I became interested in climate activism at a pretty young age. I think people that are concerned with the world around them and how our, you know, society as small as our town to our state, to our country, to our planet functions, you know, people that, that want to question that and want to find ways to improve that. I think climate activism is a jump off point because it's one of the few types of activism that one is can be done completely uh as an individual you know everyone can participate in it and, and have a important role in it and also uh it's very tangible and doesn't require a lot of uh voting you know you can be uh an important climate activist uh as soon as you're able to be responsible and hold yourself accountable for how you treat the planet and the space you occupy. Um, so you don't need to be involved in politics. You don't need to have a strong understanding of bureaucratic happenings. Uh, it's something that comes very naturally to, I think, a lot of people. And so while I have gotten older and have, you know, taken interest in other social uh, justice issues, it's definitely been the one that has stuck with me the most. And I think a big part of that is where we live and how uh, intertwined our community and, and local culture is with our environment. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Oliver. Um, that's a great point too, about how climate activism is really integrated into other social justice movements, right? So we talk about how climate justice is racial justice um, and how a lot of communities that are more impacted by climate change are already marginalized communities. Yeah. So that was a really good point about the impacts of climate activism. Um, Penelope, what about you? Sure. Um, well, I'd say I really started my climate activist journey was when I started high school. My mm -hmm. advisor for school was Erica Greenberg, who is the advisor for our environmental club. And she just drew me in. I think the first project we worked on was our annual trash and show. And I just loved the way we could connect our creative and artistic side into a way to be an activist. And I mean, I'm in the same way. I am an activist for so many different things. And I feel like I can make as much of a difference as I can within this and through our projects and in this group. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, and as I mentioned before, Water Club is uh, the environmental or climate club at Wood River High School. Um, but I'm curious if you could, one, explain if Water Club is an acronym, and then also explain a little bit of the history. So how long has it been a group at Wood River High School in the Valley, and what are some of the past projects that Water Club has worked on? Yes, it was rebranded to be Water Club in 2009 when Erica took over. It is an acronym. It stands for We Appreciate the Earth's Resources. It definitely gets a little confusing for some people. We are not just water program. <laughs> but yeah, so she started it in 2009. She took over from biology teacher who had the environmental club before. They have done some incredible projects over the years. Some of the more notable big ones. A few years ago, she had a group that passed an ordinance in our town banning all single-use plastics at Haley events. And that was kind of to piggyback off of a more a failed project, I'd say. Yeah. I think it was in 2010 or 11. There was, we had a 
plastic ban, plastic bag ban that was proposed and it was on uh, the November ballot. And I think we went against the Hypex poly bag resource company that is like the second biggest distributor of plastic bags. And we lost wow. yeah, by 7%. And afterwards, they created a state law where they have banned bans uh, at town levels. <laughs> yeah, that I think is definitely, I would say, not an example of a failed project, but an example of how difficult it can be, even with a lot of momentum, to overcome big business and politics. So I applaud uh, that group for at least trying. And I think that it sounds like from what I know about you all moving forward, there are some exciting things ahead. So our next question is, what projects are you currently working on in Water Club? So this year, this is my first year as a co-president. This is Penn's second year. And I think with a club that's so kind of mercurial based on a cycling group of members, you know, um, at, at most you get four years with a student and then they're on to uh, bigger and better things. But it means we have a lot of different tastes year to year. And so this year we've really tried to focus on accommodating every aspect of environmental activism and trying to fit each of our club members into something that they find interesting or, or, you know, a specific way they feel like they can channel their passion for the environment into what we do. So we've been doing a large mix of, you know, kind of more tangible outdoor projects. We've done um, kind of some riverside cleanups with the Wood River Land Trust and we've done some independent trail cleanups. And then coming into spring, we have uh, some lake cleanups coming up. Next week, uh, we're working with a group to do uh, some some highway pickups, like, you know, really the immediately fulfilling stuff that's uh, just getting the trash off, you know, uh, off the ground, making sure like we are cleaning up our environment and we can see that progress happening. Um, and then we also have been doing a number of educational programs for our community. So we're continuing our yearly trash and show that we do where we take, uh, you know, trash or kind of unwanted items and we repurpose them into uh, clothing pieces, which is a really fun uh, and, you know, expressive way to promote reuse and kind of a the idea of circular economy and we do it uh with the elementary schools and they have a really fun time making their own pieces and you know modeling them on the runway and it's a really fun way to get kids involved and show that well this topic is pretty serious there's plenty of fun and creative ways to address it in the fall we had a panel we hosted with carol king who's a gigantic, you know, advocate for the environment and environmental protection. And she is kind of the face of the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act, which is a gigantic program trying to kind of reclaim a uh, privatized land and kind of repurpose it for national, you know, use. And that was really fun. It's great to you know, be able to work with all these wonderful people in our, in our valley and in our kind of sphere um, and try and reach as many people as possible. So those are some of the main projects we've done this year. You all have covered a lot. And I was actually at that panel discussion. It was really phenomenal to hear about her impact. You all asked really good questions. Um, and I love to hear too, that you are working with younger students in the valley. Um, there's this great uh, fact that I read recently that when we learn through play, we actually learn, I believe it's something like 10 times faster is how much faster those new brain synapses are created. Um, so yeah, making climate action fun for younger kids is really impactful because it can be kind of intimidating or feel kind of hopeless sometimes when you, you know, see all of this stuff on the news and you're a younger, a younger kid. 
Um, so love hearing about all of the different work that you're doing up and down the valley. Our next question is related to uh, this narrative in climate action, which is I think there is this narrative that younger people feel so passionately about these issues because you all will be impacted by climate change on a much larger scale than previous generations. So we see this in um, you know, increasingly volatile weather patterns, rising global temperatures, rising sea levels, et cetera. And so I'm curious if you have experienced this gap, this generational gap in concern over climate change and how you address it when you experience it. I'd say in this valley, we kind of have a unique experience because so many people do care. I mean, Oliver and I, we attend a lot of things outside of our school and outside of our club, like the CAC meetings, for example. And I, I mean, I personally don't see that gap too much. I see people of all ages and all ethnicities and everything supporting all climate activism and projects. But I mean, any pressure is good pressure. I think having people want and feel the need to make changes is important and it shouldn't be. I don't see anything bad with it. There's always people making the joke like, sorry, we messed up. This is all on you guys, but you got it, but mm. not terrible. Yeah, I, I've noticed a similar trend. I think people kind of, you know, uh, unjustly kind of assume that older generations are more closed off to this idea. But I think it's all a mindset. And if you're willing to understand that just because something has been one way doesn't mean that's going to continue or doesn't mean that that's the way it should be done. So Penelope and I do work with a lot of people that, you know, are older in age, but very open minded, uh, very objective and, and willing to learn um, more so even sometimes than some of the kids we know or some of the you know younger people we work with you do get your fair share of people that you know think that climate change is completely cyclical and that you know this has happened before and it'll you know revert itself and that you know oh i'm i'm just one person i can't make a difference you know it has to be the higher ups that that really enact change but that comes at every age and i think there's plenty of people of all ages that are willing and wanting to make change. And it's really important that we recognize those people at all ages and kind of work together. That's awesome. Um, and I will echo that my experience in this community has been that people of all demographics do really care about our climate. And I think that that is also tied to the beauty of the place that we live in you know we live very close to nature and so people have a really tangible understanding of climate change and the importance of environmental work and um, penelope i'm going to clarify something that you mentioned for anyone who's not familiar cac stands for climate action coalition and that is a local grassroots organization in the wood river valley that is demographically i would say folks over 50 Mm -hmm. And they do really incredible work. So that kind of ties into our next question, which is how can residents, no matter their age, in the Wood River Valley support your projects and your ongoing work? I think that ties in a lot to what I said earlier about where my affinity for climate activism stems from, which is you can be any age, um, to participate in climate activism. And most importantly, it is strongest uh, in numbers. So, you know, the most important part about making a change is just being one of the many and every single person counts. Specifically in, in the Wood River Valley, like our projects are just supported by engagement. That's always the biggest focus is how can we reach as many people as possible? How can we educate as many people as possible? How can we get as many hands and minds in on this project to really strengthen that community? And Hannah actually used 
a great phrase yesterday, which is culture to build a culture around uh, sustainable living and climate activism. So, you know, every time we do a project here, we try and make it as interesting and as engaging to as many demographics as possible. So we have to think about how does this work for, you know, uh, Gen X, Gen Y, and then Gen Z, even Gen Alpha, you know, like the, the little kids we go to at the mm -hmm. elementary schools, you know, how can we make this palatable to everyone where no one feels that it's too big of a task, too much to bite off, and, oh, I, I'm kind of above this, which is a tough balance, but it really is, it does make all the difference when you're just there with open mind, open ears, open eyes, and you know, willing to learn because anyone, anyone, anyone matters as much as the next in climate activism. Penelope, anything to add? I, I think he kind of summed it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oliver, that was great. Thank you. And I would encourage any residents in the Wood River Valley watching this to definitely check out the Trash and Show and to participate in Earth Fest, which is April 20th um, in Haley. And uh, that's going to be a really amazing celebration of climate action in our valley. And I think you also touched on something important, which is that when we educate about climate action, it's important to send the message that climate action is for everybody. Thinking about the last question a little more broadly, how do you think people in our community can support youth climate activism in general? So thinking about parents of students or grandparents of students um, or even folks who spend part of their time in the Valley, um, how could people support youth climate activism more generally? I'd say my response would be similar to the last one, just educating yourself and ensuring the education of the youth be continued and everyone understand the impacts that they have and get people included and involved in all of the incredible things that we have going on in town. But I don't know, just the continued education is what's most vital is passing it on. And yeah, I don't know, Oliver, take it for me. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think as much as we preach that it is a uh, issue for everyone to address, and that's absolutely true from a point of longevity, you know, our future generations are the most important. They're the people that are going to carry this idea and this movement into the coming decades where it's, you know, it's, it's only going to become more important, more crucial to treat our planet and our global environment uh, with grace and, and poise. And I think, um, people are most impressionable and most likely to change or carry out actions through their life when they're young. That can be a really good thing when you're trying to inspire kids. You know, some of my favorite projects are where we work with little kids because they're so full of creativity and blind passion and interest and stuff like the trash and show is some of the most rewarding work we do where you can leave it that day and feel like, I really connected something I'm passionate about with these kids that will grow up and be passionate about that. You know, like I have helped kind of, you know, light the spark uh, that will make these kids want to continue to do this 10, 20, 30 years in the future. Like we joke about it all the time when we go to the schools and we say, you know, you guys are going to be the next water club members, but it's true. And then the next water mm -hmm. club members are going to be the next scientists and engineers and politicians that continue this this snowballing effect of climate activism um, up and up and up through the ranks of society. And it's really important to get them started out young, hit the ground running. So I would say to parents, you know, if it's something you care about, invest that idea, invest that attitude into your children, get them, get them to these events and educate them and have them come to the trash and show. And there's, there's so many things that are here in this Valley and really everywhere for kids. And it's just knowing where to look and taking that step and, and 
you know, making sure your kids are poised for, for change in the future. Yeah, that's great. And it's a good point too about how much the snowball effect really does matter. And when I discuss our youth programming with community members, I always say the reason that we focus, for example, so much on second graders, right, seven and eight year olds, is that they are voting in 10 years. And 10 years might feel like a long time, but it really isn't. And so uh, making sure that those younger kids have um, the ability to think critically about climate issues and um, problem solve and are inspired and are feeling creative, that's so important. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about long-term or short-term, um, what our municipalities could be doing to better support climate action and lessen our impacts yeah. as um, cities. So that could include non-incorporated areas of Blaine County, but Bellevue, Haley, Sun Valley, Ketchum, um, what could cities be doing to support these efforts? Sure, we were talking about this earlier and we see so many students making efforts and bringing things to city council meetings and to their legislators, but we don't see so much of that coming straight from the legislators. Um, so we want what we want is to see more action and more of a role that they're taking from these lawmakers. Like they, we have committees and people with certain jobs of climate action within all of our um, uh, legislators, but. We don't see much coming from them. They take action on what's brought to them, but we want to see we want to see them making things. Every time we have a project, we think, "Wow, this feels really obvious." I don't know if we mentioned it earlier. I think we may have missed it, but we brought a a project to the city council, and we are trying to create a initiative to get all of the restaurants in our town to switch their to go containers to all compostable or biodegradable products, and we just think that should be obvious we should have our legislators want to see that already in our schools we still have styrofoam containers for all of our uh, school lunches and we just those seem too obvious to not have already been changed so i i mean that's how i see it <laughs> we want to see more participation yeah um oliver the question if you're able to hear us was how could municipalities be better supporting climate action. Um, and this could be a long-term or short-term idea, but you mentioned these kind of big innovative ideas answering the last question. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on what municipalities could be doing better. Yeah, I think especially in small towns where we live, um, one of the most important things local government can do is stay local and you know utilize this rare chance they have to really integrate with their community like this is a a town where you see your mayor and your city council men and women at dinner parties and at the supermarket and you know they're so close and so taking that opportunity to really be able to listen and get a holistic view of how your community feels um be that through city council meetings or you know, just being open and available to listen and to take into account uh, how your town feels and how the people you're kind of governing want to see change is really important. And I think understanding that governments are just groups and organizations of people, and they they owe owe it to their their citizens and the people they're governing to treat them and respect them and and kind of understand their opinions and their viewpoints with respect. Take the time to listen and to be open-minded. And again, what I said earlier, you know, just because something's been done some way doesn't mean that's how it should be done or that's how it should, you know, continue to go. There's nothing wrong with change or trying something new or mixing something up and taking a risk because there's a good chance that it could be the change that we want to see. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, our last question is, 
what is something, so this could be a policy, a community initiative, um, a fund development in technology, what is something that makes you hopeful about our climate future? And this could be locally or globally. I'd say to answer that, I feel everyone has, I guess, different priorities within their climate activism and what they are most concerned about. Personally, I feel like I take a focus on overconsumption because I see it so vividly within my generation with social media and such. Everything is all focused on consuming and the, the money making part of all companies. But just what I've seen with brands being more mindful with their uh, marketing and trying to create a more conscious pool of consumers. Exactly. And yeah. sure that people aren't they're, they're, they're people are being more responsible with their habits. And it's, I mean, it is all, all habit based when you learn what your shopping impacts are, realizing what you are doing, it, it I don't know, you make a change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the kind of introduction of slow fashion mm -hmm. has been really cool to watch over the last several years. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm with you on that, that makes me hopeful. Um, Oliver, what about you? I think one of the kind of larger than life things I kind of allow myself to stress about and feel very passionate about is uh, sustainable energy, which at first does not seem like it's, it seems like a really big behemoth of a topic and something that can't really be tackled at home. And there are there are some aspects of that that do ring true you know i think i think the outcome the the goal however far it is or however far it appears at the moment is a sustainable energy you know be that solar or wind which have a long way to go i personally am a big fan of uh, nuclear energy i think it needs a bit of a rebrand because i think the phrase nuclear scares a lot of people and i think it's wildly misunderstood but i think nuclear fission and fusion are fantastic um you know options and with a little more funding and a little more money could be you know what really helps us 10 20 years down the line but on a small scale i think energy is still something you can have an impact on at home like getting you know low energy uh bulbs for your house and saving rainwater instead of using sprinklers and taking that's you know it's kind of a, a cliche or like a an overused trope but that's because it is so true like taking shorter showers using turning the faucet off when you brush your teeth little things like that on a grand scale you know when when done in in myriad across entire communities across entire states do make a huge change and there's so many things that you don't think about that are using energy needlessly and doing a little bit of research and understanding, wow, I really don't even think about this in my day to day, but this could cut back on some of my energy use um, is really important. And it's that that kind of is the catalyst for making people and eventually making these gigantic capitalistic companies want to change their their use of energy and their output of energy and so i think that's something that is a gigantic you know colossal topic but not something that uh you should shy away from or feel that you don't have a say in because that's far from the truth yeah i think your focus on energy and concerns over energy consumption and production kind of parallels uh, Penelope's concern over consumerism in a lot of interesting ways, um, one of which is that collective demand really does have the power to shift the market. And so if people are opposing fast fashion pretty vehemently and opposing fossil fuels and coal plants, I don't know if you read this recently, but one of the last or the last I think coal facilities in the Northeast was shut down in the last couple of weeks, which is really cool. But when we think about energy, you know, Idaho has three main utilities and they are moving in the right direction, but encouraging folks to use energy 
at non-peak times of the day, for example, is another great way to lower the cost of energy. And a note on water, you know, Idaho is technically still in a drought. And so water quantity is important. And anything we can do to decrease our water use is um, so impactful. Any final thoughts that either of you would like to add before we wrap up? I don't think I so. I would just say thank you so much for having us. I always appreciate when people are interested in, in what we have to say, you know, both me and Penelope, but also just youth voices as a whole. And I find it almost funny that one of the questions we almost always get asked when doing interviews or when talking or when at meetings is how can how can we help to make youth voices still heard when in reality you know it's stuff like this that that is taking the the brunt of that issue and so we really appreciate you know having a platform talk and inspire and and converse with other people and just put our word out there and hope that it strikes someone in a poignant enough way that they you know decide to to take a stand and, and speak up as well. Thank you both so much again for your time. I'm grateful for your perspectives. Again, thank you for being here. And um, we look forward to seeing the Water Club at Earth Fest on April 20th.